Thank you, Pastor. It's, it's really great to be back. It's good to be back in the Oregon Conference where I spent about 12 years, and now I represent, uh, I do work at the General Conference, and I do bring you greetings from our uh, president, uh, Elder Neil, uh, Elder N Ted Wilson. So we're, we're very happy to uh, be here. It's unusual times, no question about it. We're living in a very uh, tumultuous time. There are some who are extremely fearful, and there are others who need to be more fearful than they are. It was former President John F. Kennedy who said, the Chinese use two brushstrokes to write the word crisis. One brushstroke stands for danger, the other for opportunity. In a crisis, be aware of danger, but recognize opportunity. You know, for the past several weeks, every newspaper, newscast, placards and grocery stores and in restaurants have all reminded us that there is a, 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 a pandemic that is taking place around the world in, in all, just about every country, I believe. It is a time of global crisis. Some call it the pandemic because of COVID-19 has penetrated every area of the world. But you know, you and I know about another pandemic that's been going on for at least 6,000 years. 6,000 years of sin has captured the attention and the hearts of men and women around the world. The question for us today, perhaps the best said by Francis Schaeffer in his book, how then shall we live? So the question is, how then shall we live during a time of crisis, during a time of uncertainty? How should we live? You may not even be aware that there is today celebrated all around the world what we call Possibility Ministry Sabbath. Uh, around the world right now, there are celebrations going on about possibility ministries. And I have a feeling many of you have never even heard about that. This ministry gives focus to nearly 1.5 billion people in the world. I've been asked to give direction to this particular ministry for the world church. 1.5 billion members who are included in this particular ministry. It has become a mobile, a, a global uh, movement around the world. It includes seven different ministries. Seven different ministries, including the deaf, the blind, the physical, the mental, orphans, vulnerable children, the widowed, and caregivers. Those seven broad categories, when you put them all together around the world, represent about 1.5 billion people. This becomes what we call a compassionate ministry, a ministry that is really about showing care and concern for these people. Already this morning, we, I have received messages from these groups of people around the world. I've heard from, for example, South Africa, Russia, Ukraine, Brazil, Inter-America, Australia, Kenya, Spain, and uh, others have even contacted me today. It is exciting to see what is happening. But I want to ask you, I want to encourage you that we must learn to think differently. There is a great need that we have to learn to think differently because thinking the same way isn't going to help us meet the crises that these people are meeting day in and day out, and now specifically during this time of serious challenges with the COVID-19. We can see differently because God sees us differently. And unless we begin with that perspective, we will begin to see the world. We're going to begin to see the crises at the same way everybody else does. But we have been given a special advantage. God sees possibilities in each of us. God can look and notice this quote by Ellen White. Christ can look on the misery of the world without a shade of sorrow for having created man. 
in the human heart, he sees more than sin, more than misery. Let me just pause there for a moment. Despite all the challenges that God must see in our world, what we find here is that he sees more than sin, more than misery. Notice now what's next. In his infinite wisdom and love, he sees man's, what? He sees man's possibilities, the height to which he may attain. That's exciting. Because God says, I see possibilities in you that you may not even see in yourself. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul is suggesting that we need to see things differently. We need to be differently so that we can see differently. I'd like to suggest that indeed we have been given a prophetic call for change. A change in which the way we see things, we see ourselves, the way we see one another, the way we see the world in, as at large. The world has too often influenced our thinking. It teaches that a person is valued by what they can do and devalued by what they cannot do. Socialized evolution is more at work than we realize. If you could travel with me, you would see what I mean. Because every single country that I've traveled to, I begin to see that indeed we devalue people who are different than we are, who can't do the same things we can. They can't see, they can't hear, they can't walk, they can't talk. We begin to devalue them and we begin to place them at a different level of appreciation. We must learn to look at each other differently. There needs to be a voice of hope somewhere in this world, speaking to all kinds of people with all sorts of abilities, backgrounds and habits, whatever case we may find people in, there needs to be a voice of hope, a voice of hope regardless of what they can do or cannot do. And regardless of what they may have shamefully done or not done, we still need to bring to them a value of hope. Possibility Ministries is an inclusive ministry that is not stuck on some social class, some gender, some race, or some economic class. It is a ministry about unexpected possibilities. It is a voice of hope that is changing that is changing the way we think and therefore what we can become. It is a prophetic voice. I met Eric Benemer several years ago, several years ago when I was in Georgia. Eric had been invited to speak to our hospital board, of which I was a member, and a number of other uh, medical staff were there. Eric is an unusual person. Let me explain. Eric is a mountain climber, a biker, a skydiver, a scuba diver. In fact, he has climbed the highest mountain in every continent, including Mount Everest. He's an amazing, amazing person just to meet. But what is really amazing is that he did all these things while being blind. So he does these things as, as a blind person. That's right, he claimed Mount Everest while he was blind. He, he was married on top of Kilimanjaro. So he is a, indeed a very strange person. But he's been blind since the age of 13. He wasn't always blind, but he became blind at the age of 13. You see, no one told Eric that in the dictionary there is actually a word called impossible. He saw things as possible, even though he was blind. And what was really strange was he was trained as an elementary teacher. Eric believed that he could teach. And I can't believe, actually, that I, 
at a school board actually hired a blind teacher to teach sighted children. But they did. He had 30 students, but he was smart. He says, I know how to do it. And so he got a magnetic board, bought magnetic letters and magnetic n- numbers, a box for each one. It was perfect timing. I mean, he, he knew what to do. But what was really exciting is that when he was teaching, he would put the letters up there, and he would, I mean, conventional wisdom says that teachers put sentences on boards and formulas on boards for math. That's the way you're taught. That's what you teach. That's how you teach. But that first day didn't go so well. That first day, Eric got his numbers and his letters mixed up. And it was embarrassing. He could hear the snickers from the kids because he had gotten things mixed up. So that night when he went home, he was, you know, it was his own personal crisis. What do you do? I mean, everything was falling apart, his training and everything, and he got it all mixed up. His one strategy, his one solution fell apart. So what do you do? As a teacher, he had to unlearn much of what he had been taught about teaching in order to teach. That's an important concept to keep in mind. Sometimes our conventional way of thinking is actually the obstacle. His answer. His answer was actually sitting right in front of him. He had 30 sets of perfect eyes sitting before him. And at first that seemed like an obstacle, but with further thinking began to realize that that was actually the answer. To find the answer to his personal crisis, he was forced to ask different questions. Different questions. That was the challenge. What questions should he ask? You see, that's our challenge too. We have to learn to find the right questions to ask so we can find the right answer. And that's what Eric did. You see, once Eric realized that the real, what the real question was, he was able to find the real answer. Obstacles provided new opportunities. What? That's right. Obstacles provided new opportunities. And so what he did, he began to realize that those sighted kids could become his assistant teachers. And those teachers began to write on the board that he could not do. They began to put the math formulas on the board, and he began to guide them and teach them as they were his assistants. Aha. Obstacles became the opportunity for a new way of teaching and perhaps an even better way of teaching. It was an amazing what he learned. And as we go to the Bible, we begin to find that God asked us to remove some obstacles. We find in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, for example, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low, the crooked places shall be made straight. John the Baptist picked up this later on, and that was the very prophetic message he used to prepare the way for Jesus. Mountains had to be removed. Valleys had to be raised. And they began to realize that the obstacles were no obstacle for God. But God needed a prophetic voice, and he found it in Isaiah and he found it in John the Baptist, and he can find it in us today if we realize that God is with us. You see, instead of obstacles, we become possibilities. Instead of the world becoming an obstacle, we begin to see it as a possibility. It's a matter of changing the way we see the challenges before us. So I ask myself many times, Could you and I be limiting ourselves and others because we've been squeezed into the world's mode of depreciating one another, fearing the circumstances that are around us, and anxious, unmercifully anxious about things that we cannot control? I find that that is a challenge for us today. 
So maybe Paul's counsel in Romans is right on after all. Maybe Paul really knew what he was talking about. Maybe before we can see, we need to become. Before we can see, we need to become. And by being transformed, by the renewing of our minds, it means a whole new way of thinking, a whole new way of living. We then will be able to see the world in a different way. But I want to remind you, and, and me, this hope isn't just for us. We have a prophetic voice of hope for these critical times. It's needed, and you and I need to be that voice. We've been called to remove mountains. This requires a different way of thinking. It requires a different way of seeing our world and a different way of living. It's a transformed, total person that God is asking. It's a special kind, just like Gideon's army. It, it's a special kind. It's not the numbers, it's the message. It's the messengers that God is preparing for a very special time. For some, it may mean experiencing God again for the first time. I know that there are some who are watching. Some have told me that they would be watching. And I'm speaking to you. For some, it may mean experiencing God again for the first time. I'm speaking to you. Come again to that first experience you once had with God. See, in times of crisis, we are given an opportunity to think differently. While some are very fearful, and shelter themselves away from any kind of communication to their hearts except fear. God is speaking and says, think differently. I'll show you five personal areas where we might need to adjust our thinking. These are areas that I have seen as a pastor, as a leader in the church, that I feel that we need to take advantage of the crisis for. Let us come together and at least look at these five. There are many more than five, but let me just share with you five that are on my heart today. These are steps of preparation for moving mountains. It begins with our own transformation. Every one of us. I'm speaking to myself as much as anyone else. The first one is make prayer your first response. In times of crisis, you will hear many voices. Choose prayerfully what voices you listen to. Make God's voice your first choice. The Bible says, Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. You hear what I'm saying? Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Anxiety, prayer, Pull them together. Number two, learn to forgive. Unforgiveness has a power to warp our thinking and cloud our reasoning. It can dilute our prophetic voice. Remember Joseph? The story of Joseph was one of my very favorite stories in the book of Genesis. In fact, Genesis closes with a story of Joseph. Rightly so, because of the way sin entered into the early part of Genesis, it climaxes with the story of Joseph. Joseph faced a crisis, family betrayal, a strange land, imprisonment, false accusations. Man, he had them all. Each crisis, though, prepared him for the days ahead, days he could not comprehend at the moment, at the moment, he couldn't see why, why, why. But each step prepared him to be a leader, to be a voice for God. No wonder, Ephesians says, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. 
forgiving one another. Unforgiveness warps our mind and keeps us away from becoming what God needs us to become. Number three, assumed in the first two, but it needs to be spoken of separately. You know, Jesus has never left us. We may have left him, but he hasn't left us. During a crisis, it is sometimes difficult to see how he has been stepping in and protecting us even from ourselves, from our own choices. But he has never taken away our own personal choice. He's given that to us. And we need to make the right choices. Let me assure you, God is on your side. You will always be special to him. You may do some really stupid things. I know I have. But I'm still special in his sight. We must draw close to God. As families, we need to pull together. We draw near to God, and he will draw near to us. Not because he wasn't there already, but all of a sudden that nearness becomes awareness, and we become closer to him, and and God soothes our anxieties and opens our eyes for possibilities. Number four, we need to let go. Let go so we can embrace what God has in store for us. Let go. For some, whatever we thought we deserved, whatever we expected out of a relationship or a job may not have happened. We must let go. Let go of the bitterness or the hurt. Whatever temptation or sin that has its grip on us, we need to let go. Let go of that sin that has so hung on to us and choking us, let go. And what we may have thought of was as a door of opportunity is often a door that was not really meant for us anyway. We must let go. Let go of what has passed us by. Let go and let God have your life. For when we let go of our stubborn pride, of our hurt feelings, a new life awaits for us. Let go of the past. Don't try to write the conclusion when God is still adding chapters. So often we begin to think that this is the end of my career, of my family, of my life. And I just want to counsel you. Don't try to write a conclusion when God is still ready to add chapters to your experience and to your life. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. Isaiah 42, verse 9, makes that very clear. And finally, number five, begin believing again. We must never let COVID-19 dominate our belief or our life. God is bigger than any crisis, come what may. Even dreams about coming back to God sometimes come with adversity and setbacks. So be it. Regardless, we keep believing, we keep pressing on. The secret to a long-term believing relationship with God is staying connected with him in both good times and in bad times. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, a famous passage for all of us. I know, and this is taken from the message. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out, plans to take care of you, not to abandon you, plans to give you a future that you hope for. I have the privilege of going to many places in the world. I was invited to meet Reggiani for the first time in Brazil. Reggiani was a very gracious person. The person who took me to see Reggiani was blind. Juliana took me took me there to see her, and Reggiani was blind. And I, I met Reggiani's family, a husband, two children, wonderful time. They took me there on a Friday night, and we were having, it was just before Sabbath, and we had a wonderful meal. It was really special, just being able to sit down and talk to people. I don't get to do that a lot. A lot of my times are in committees and flying and all those kind of things, but this was a really a personal experience. 
And after our, our supper that evening, we, we sat down in the family room, all kind of a semicircle, and we began telling our stories. And Reggiani's story was not one I had heard before. You see, it started out as a normal day. It was a normal day for her. She was going from work to the bank and then on her way home. She went to the bank to uh, withdraw some money. What she didn't see was that close by were a couple of men watching her withdraw the money. They were seated on a motorcycle, and as Reggiani drove out from, her, uh, from, from the parking lot there at the bank, the motorcycle followed her. They got to a particular place in the road, and the motorcycle drove up real close to the driver's side of the car. The passenger on the back side of the motorcycle pulled out a gun and aimed it right at Reggiani's head and fired. What she remembers is the breaking of the glass of the car. What happened next was that the car careened off and crashed. Passerby saw what happened. They came running, opened the door, and pulled her out of the car. She had been shot in the head going through one temple and out the other, and the bullet is still lodged somewhere in, her, in the back of her skull. But that moment, Reggiani's life changed forever. Reggiani lost sight of both eyes. Reggiani lost sight, but she did not lose faith. I met there. I was by, invited to speak. It was a large gathering. Uh, the church gave up their sanctuary with seated about 300, 350, and they went into the gymnasium and opened the church for people to come. Blind, crippled, deaf people came from all over. It was a packed church. I was privileged to be the speaker, but the point wasn't me. They didn't come to hear me. They came to hear the story. For Reggiani had created a small group Bible study, mostly of blind people, 45 people. And that day, some were being baptized. Reggiani had one big message. That big message was, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Not only for saving my life, but for sending me and giving me this whole family of blind people. It was an amazing experience. I mean, to, to see people who are unable to walk, unable to see, that's my work. I, I, I see people all the time. They can't even be baptized without someone carrying them into the water. I see wheelchairs roll down to the lake so somebody can take them out of the chair and baptize them. I see deaf people who have never heard a word in their life except the word of God. And they hear that, and their life is changed. I have a most precious work, and yet I deal with people who are devalued by society. I'm convinced that they are the prophetic voice for today. And I'm just an instrument to help remove the obstacles so that their voice can be heard. In our ministry, some years ago, I heard a song, a song that I, 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 I wanted to make as a theme song, and I shared it with my division leaders, and the division leaders said, yes, we'll make that our theme song. The title of it is called Not Alone. I heard it sung by an orphan choir from Uganda, the Watoto Children's Choir, sang this song, and the words were so powerful, I, I, I'd like to just Read just some of those words. Through all of my tears, you see my fears. I'm not alone. When I need a friend, you take my hand. I'm not alone. If the trials come and my worries seem too much to bear, Lord, lift me up and hold me close. I am not alone. That's who we are. We are the prophetic voice to tell the world they are not alone. We are the prophetic voice of hope, giving people encouragement in times of crisis. 
And yes, we are a kind of people who look at the, at the world and we see the deaf, we see the blind, we see the lame, we see the widowed, we see the caregivers who are taking care of the whole group. We see the orphans and the vulnerable children. And we have a prophetic message to give them. But excuse me, excuse me, it's not us giving to them. Not only for they have something to give to the world too. So often we have dealt with them as if they are desperately in need of our, our kindness and our goodness. But everyone that I've ever talked to wants to be involved with mission and to contribute to the well-being of other people. And so together, together we have a voice for the world to tell the world that regardless of what happens to us, regardless of what we can do or what we cannot do, we have a voice of hope that says we are never alone. God is with us. Let's pray. Our gracious God, thank you for your loving kindness. What can we say? We're so undeserving of what you have to offer. You see in every one of us possibilities that are not realized. And help us, Lord, to have a renewed mind that we will see in every person, every young person who may have strayed away or every person who, has, who may have fallen away from that relationship they once had with you. Help us, Lord, to be the possibility thinkers who see in others, to see in a world darkened by sin, possibilities that others may never see. Grant us that gift, Lord. Grant us that gift that we might be like Jesus and see in the tax collector, in the prostitute, in the rich and the poor, possibilities that they may not even see in themselves. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.